initiative from members of the Yale NOMAS chapter, which strives to foster greater inclusion, unity, and representation at the Yale School of Architecture. Also, each of these discussions is a collaboration with a different guest university. Today, we are partnering with Columbia's University Latin GSEP. It is an interdisciplinary student organization dedicated to the promotion, discussion, and reflection of contemporary issues and ideas in Latin America. Today marks the first of our uh, three-part series of events and we will focus on the topic of agency in architecture. The discussion will explore the expanding agency of the architect from the interface between architecture and other fields, such as political science, sociology, and environmental science, to the relationship and difference between agency in practice and pedagogy. Our panelists today include Elisa Iturbe, She's a critic at the Yale School of Architecture where she teaches design studios and seminars dedicated to studying the spatial expression of our dominant energy paradigm in both urban and architectural form. She also coordinates the dual degree program between YSOA and the Yale School of, Art of the Environment. Recently, she guest edited Log 47 titled Overcoming Carbon Form and co-wrote a book with Peter Eisenman titled Lateness. In addition, she's adjunct assistant professor at the Per Union and is the co-founder of the firm Outside Development. Elisa was born in Mexico City and grew up in San Diego along the US-Mexico border. We also have joining us today, Enrique Walker. He's an architect and lecturer at Columbia GSEP, where he directed the Master of Science program in Advanced Architectural Design from 2008 to 2018. In addition, he has taught at the MIT, Princeton University, Tokyo Institute of Technology, and Universidad de Chile. His publications include The Ordinary Recordings, The Dictionary of Received Ideas Under Constraints, Lo Ordinario, and Shumi on Architecture, Conversations with Enrique Walker. We're also joined by Adriana Chavez. She's an adjunct assistant professor at Columbia GSEP. She holds a master's degree from Harvard, Harvard's GSD and a bachelor's degree from Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City. She is the co-founder of PORU, Office for Urban Resilience, a design think tank that focuses on implementing innovative solutions for cities through urban design and landscape infrastructure with a water-sensitive approach. Finally, moderating the discussion, we have students from both schools. Uh, I'm one of them. Uh, I am Guillermo Costa Navarrete, originally from Mexico City. And I am in my final year of the MRC program at Yale. I was recently an architect in residence at the Max Center for Art and Architecture in Los Angeles, and I'm the current co-editor of the forthcoming 56th issue of Perspective. Alice Fang is originally from Sao Paulo, Brazil. She's in her last year in the Masters of Architecture program at Columbia's GSEP, where she is currently the co-director of Latin GSEP, as well as part of the editorial team for Patio, a newly launched publication. She most recently worked at Model in Brooklyn. And finally, we have Gabriel Gutierrez Huerta. He's originally from Tijuana, Mexico, and is in his final year of the post-professional MR2 program at Yale. He has practiced in both New York and Baja California, Mexico, and is currently co-editor of the forthcoming 56th issue of Perspect. Um, with that, we'll start uh, with initial 10-minute remarks from each of our panelists, followed by an open discussion. And just a reminder to everyone joining us that you can engage in the conversation by leaving your questions in the chat. And throughout the event, our student moderators will work them into the conversation, but there will be also some time uh, for Q&A at the, towards the end. So let's turn it over to Elisa. Elisa, you should be able to share your screen. Great, thank you. All right, got everything in order. 
Hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, and thank you so much for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here um, and very excited to be talking about this question of agency, um, which is very pervasive in architecture today. I feel like we're talking about it a lot. And that makes sense because in the face of the climate crisis, in the face of worsening inequality, in the face of uh, this pervasive neoliberal attitude from our governments that you know, even still, despite these things, there is no alternative. So in that context, how can architecture have agency? And architecture in any case is fully embedded into this monstrous real estate machine. And that machine prioritizes commodification of space above everything. Um, and that seems to render architecture uh, perhaps useless or at the very least, certainly powerless. And so we are resigned and so we feel helpless. Um, and so we ask, does architecture have agency? Um, however, I think that an attitude of resignation would imply that the current conditions of architectural practice are the defining boundaries of architecture itself. And that I'm not so convinced by. Um, and so I wonder whether architecture's relationship to the dominant economic order, which is unde undeniable, is not an ending point from which to declare architecture powerless, but a starting point to investigate the nature of its power. So today I'm going to suggest a few things. Um, first, that architecture is powerful. Uh, second, that architecture's power is not always for the best. Um, and that perhaps there's a difference between agency and power. So in my mind, there's no question that architecture has power and throughout history, architecture has had a very close relationship to power. Vitruvius dedicated the 10 books to Caesar Augustus. Uh, Le Corbusier was um, a little bit less specific, but uh, still very clear on his position. And he dedicated uh, the Ville Radius to authority. And so we have these architectural treatises that are dedicated to empires and to authority itself. My area of research is the spatial paradigm that arises from the onset of fossil fuels or because of the onset of fossil fuels. And that's something that I like to call carbon form. And early carbon form was very chaotic. This is an etching of Victorian London. Um, and in this time, you had demographic shifts that are associated with the enclosure movement and with the rise of factory labor. And these things transformed the city almost overnight. And at this time, architectural typologies were emerging, but these changes were haphazard. They lacked intention and the city seemed kind of out of control. It was growing and changing as capitalists and factory owners were pushing this new economic regime with all the power that was unleashed by fossil fuels. But eventually carbon form becomes an architectural project because modernism was reacting directly to this uh, condition of the 19th century city. So often you, we talk about modernisms as though, uh, modernism as though they were interested in this kind of blanket rejection of the past. But if you read these treatises closely, that's not actually true. These modern treatises on the city were full of references to ancient cities and classical architecture. So the modernists, I would argue, are largely concerned not with history necessarily, but specifically with the 19th century city. Um, so that leads uh, Ludwig Hilversheimer in the new city to look at a congested street and to look at the skyline of New York and to call this disorder and chaos. Um, and then we have Le Corbusier who writes that in the last hundred years, a sudden chaotic and sweeping invasion, uh, unforeseen and overwhelming has, defend, has descended upon the great city. And we've been caught up in this with all its back consequences with the result that we have stood alone and done nothing. He goes on, um, the resulting chaos has brought it about that the great city, which should be a phenomenon of power and energy, is today a menacing disaster since it is no longer governed by the principles of geometry. So this to me is extremely telling. Um, the problem here is not necessarily industry. What's lacking is geometry. What's lacking is order, intention, and structure. So even as they were declaring a break with history, their problem was not with history as a whole. The problem was that the cities of the 19th century were continuing the formal logic of the medieval city. And so that's how you get the opening chapter of the 
city of tomorrow with the contrast between the pack donkey's way and the man's way. And you get statements such as this one where um, Le Corbusier writes, a modern city lives by a straight line inevitably. The circulation of traffic demands a straight line. It's the proper thing for the heart of the city. The curve is ruinous, difficult and dangerous. It's paralyzing. Okay, so this is not just a treatise for straight streets. What I read here is a plea for a new urban form that can accommodate a new kind of mobility. It's essentially a plea to make space for a new world order. So there's another passage from the city of tomorrow that's really remarkable and I'm not going to read it all, but essentially what you have here is that you have Corb, he's walking along, he's narrating a fall afternoon where he's just strolling along in the Champs-Élysées and the traffic has just started up again after a lazy summer. And he's contemplating this. He's thinking about how the streets used to be a place for singing. The road belonged to us then, he writes. He's hanging out in the streets with his friends. But, but now they're full of motors in all directions, going at all speeds. I was overwhelmed, he writes, and enthusiastic. Rapture filled me. Not the rapture of the shiny coachwork under the gleaming, gleaming lights, but the rapture of power, the simple and ingenious pleasure of being in the center of so much power, so much speed. We are a part of it. We are a part of that race whose dawn is just awakening. We have confidence in this new society, which will in the end arrive at a magnificent expression of its power. We believe in it. Um, and, you, and he goes on, it gets even more dramatic. No, the power is like a torrent swollen by storms of destructive fury, the city is crumbling. So this is very dramatic. It's very dramatic and very extreme. Um, but what's so interesting about it is that in the congestion, he's, okay, he's standing in the middle of a traffic jam, okay? And in this congestion, what he sees is potential. What he sees is power. So he walks away from this experience ready to destroy the old city and ready to give form to something new because he saw in this moment, he's immersed in the speed and the congestion of early carbon form. What he understood is that the true potential of carbon form had not been realized. So harnessing that power would from then on become his project. And that's how you get an architect that's willing to take the existing form of the city and tear it open in order to give it a new form. So at this point, um, I wanna be very clear that I am not romanticizing the modern. It's a basic premise of my work that when architecture takes on carbon form as a project, it strengthens this spatial paradigm irreversibly. And that's why we are today at the verge of extinction. It's a legacy that we have not shaken. But I think also we have to revisit this moment and to understand that the modern period showed that architecture can have extraordinary power, but that power is not always for the best, um, especially because the promise of that power, this power that Le Corbusier saw when having his moment of ecstasy on the Champs-Élysées is now paired with the promise of extinction. So what I would, would ask or what I would suggest is that the question today is maybe not whether we have power. I think architecture embodies power all too easily. It's not just in the modern moment. The first great works of architecture were first and foremost projects of power. In this moment you had the labor of vast populations that had to be harnessed not just for the construction of these buildings or these temples but you had to basically devise a whole new social structure where architectural productivity could create a surplus. And that surplus is ultimately what allowed for the conditions of architectural production to emerge. So architecture and power have always existed side by side. So in my mind, the question is not whether we have power. In my mind, the question is whether we can dedicate our work to a different civilization building project or simply a different project entirely. So to return to the question of agency, maybe there's a difference between agency and power. And maybe agency can be found in refusing power. And if architecture has the power already to give form to our current socio-political and economic structure, surely it has the power to give form to something else. And maybe agency in architecture is found in the ability to locate that difference. <laughs>
maybe agency in architecture is found in the moments when we ask whether our work is serving power or not. So one of the reasons I like to look at the modern, which I know is very unpopular to think about modernists, um, but one of the reasons why I like looking at them is that there, there is a similar moment that has arisen today. So there's a similar danger because the, the modernists looks, looked around them and they said, the city is not working. And the same has happened again. Our cities are not working. The suburbs are not working. Real estate development and global development are not working. And right now the production of the built environment is essentially built on a faulty premise. The premise that we have infinite resources, the premise that the economy can keep growing, the premise that we can continue to commodify architecture in the way that we have and that that wealth that that produces is somehow a positive thing. So I think our work now is to not hope for the right commission um, and to try to find agency within uh, the way that commissions are structured today, but our agency perhaps can be found in reconsidering the city itself. I think that agency might emerge through our knowledge of the city, because today things have to be arranged and rearranged in space to suit the climate crisis and to adjust to it. We're going to have mass migrations, sinking cities, shrinking cities. We have all these new and difficult conditions that are emerging both before and after disaster. So we have this other moment again, similar to the modern moment where we can look around and say, the city is not working. So there's no question in my mind that architects will have to play an important role, but I think it's going to be necessary to refuse the current conditions of architectural work and to build more than buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. That was great. Can we pass it on to Enrique? Can you see it, uh, Guillermo? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I really appreciate uh, taking part in this uh, conversation. I will address the question obliquely through uh, my teaching, or let's say the way in which I, I think I've intersected obliquely the topic in recent teaching. I, um, for the past uh, three years, I've been teaching a studio at Columbia University called uh, Open Work. It's a, uh, it's a series that focuses on buildings that uh, about 50 years ago were designed to change and to grow. In other words, a period in which buildings were designed as systems rather than buildings, open-ended, unfinished, and incomplete uh, systems. So what the studio does is basically I select a number of case studies and the studio examines uh, these buildings, their arguments, their design techniques, the genealogies within which they could potentially be situated, uh, and the architecture and the cities they may imagine. Um, the cases I've actually worked in the past have been primarily from the 60s and 70s in Japan, namely coming out of the debate around uh, metabolism, such as uh, work by Kenzo Tange, uh, Kiyonori Kikutake, Arata Isosaki, um, Masato Otaka, uh, Fumihiko Maki, uh, Kishogurokawa, Kenzo Tange, Sachi Otani, and uh, um, Masato Taka again. So the, the point of this studio is actually to, um, it, it has a very precise uh, brief, which is that uh, students are asked to join a team, they work always collectively, and they're assigned a building and they're asked simply to double the surface of the building. Um, that's all they're asked to do which in a way uh, sets up an, an, a number of, uh, of problems and difficulties, which is the actual setup of the studio, which is that you, you basically must, one way or another, engage a conversation with a building. In other words, define or take a position on a building and its arguments in order to design. In fact, the first question is, do you endorse the openness of the building? And if so, with what protocols? Since the building is 50 years old, the protocols may be completely outmoded. On the other, do you simply counter openness? And if so, with what architecture? Since the questions of open use, open authorship, and open meaning still linger, even though the project is not treated as, as open. This studio I've taught for an, a number of, uh, of episodes, as I usually do. Um, yet last uh, semester, 
I taught uh, a slightly different case study, which introduced a, a question that intersects uh, the issue at stake in this uh, seminar, which is exactly what I'm presenting, and through which I basically try to um, engage the question obliquely. So for, for a number of, uh, of, of reasons that would be long to explain, I basically taught a studio where the cases were now driven from um, South American debate. And I chose basically um, two buildings from the late 60s and early 70s, uh, Lina Bobardi's Maspi in Sao Paulo and the uh, UNCTAD III um, uh, building in Santiago, Chile, uh, built by a group of five uh, different architects. Um, those images under construction and then the projects as built. The, the common denominator is, of course, uh, the, not only the fact that they're sitting on the sort of a main boulevard of, uh, of the city and that the buildings span uh, the full uh, site, either on the long uh, uh, side or on the short side, but they were both buildings that were designed under democracy as social condensers of sorts just before the countries, the respective countries, uh, fell into dictatorship. And the question of the studio was, in addition to how you position yourself vis a via building that was there before uh, you and that you had to expand, it was how do you also position yourself vis a via building whose fate and meaning had completely changed, and in fact, whose political context had changed regardless of the wish and the will of the architect. Of the two cases, of course, the one I thought was more decisive is the one of the UNCTAD III, which you probably don't know, as well as the one by Lina Bobardi, which uh, to some extent was the centerpiece of the studio, but I could not admit it until probably now. Um, and, uh, and the reason being that basically this building, which is the one I'm going to present, is uh, implied a sort of very difficult problem that allowed for me to, in addition to the briefs of the studio, set up the question of how does architect operate, in fact, the question of, the, of here today of agency and how an architect operates within conditions and circumstances often adopts with the architect's position, position in architecture, position in life, position vis-a-vis -vis society, but also the way in which architects uh, can operate politically to sort of advance a project that may be in fact undermining, destabilizing or subverting the very system for which the architect uh, works. And the UNCTAD was a, an extraordinary example. In brief, this was a project that was built in 1971. Um, it was, um, a project commissioned by the government of Salvador Allende, socialist uh, government in, in Chile. As I said, in 1971, Chile um, got the, um, the possibility of basically organizing a UN um, um, conference called the UNCTAD III, but there was no adequate auditorium for the main uh, session, as a result of which Allende commissioned a project. The project was basically done under incredible pressure of time. Uh, it was designed and built in 275 days under a year. And it was uh, located on the main thoroughfare of Santiago on the Alameda on as a basically very large building that will operate as a canopy over the site adjacent to a tower of a sort of a late Corbusian uh, team tennis uh, um, housing project uh, that was already being built on the site. So the project was basically a superstructure um, spanning the full site under which there would be basically the auditorium and other uh, programs adjacent to a tower. The problem being that basically the main driving force being how to build it fast in order to basically meet the expectations of uh, the conference. So the project was uh, in, proposed not unlike a sort of, sort of, sort of fun palace of sorts, uh, although the references were coming from elsewhere uh, in a very wide range of references. Um, as a sort of large umbrella, as I said, that would cover the site instantly on spans of 40 meters, which were then unthinkable for uh, a place like Santiago, under which the rest of the building could be basically built uh, separately. The project was basically built, as I said, on record time, um, as an extraordinarily large uh, structure and with very little technology. It was the first uh, cordon steel building uh, in, uh, in Santiago. And it was basically addressed as a sort of a political act by Allende, not only by placing it on the main thoroughfare, but also by uh, engaging a question of authorship where the five architects were coming from five different teams. They, they made a new super office that was, had never worked together and would never work together again. And they were paid in, uh, in accordance to what workers were, were paid. And they were given credits just on a large list of people 
where the architects were sitting next to the workers and everyone else that basically joined uh, a large team. That was also a sort of a enshrined in, a, in the large sort of a luncheon that was given when the building was uh, topping its uh, structure. And, um, and the building basically became an, an emblematic uh, piece of Salvador Allende's government, not only because it was going to be a, a cultural center that would become the, the, assembly, the whole for this assembly and then be a cultural center thereafter, but also because of the sort of epic of building it on record time with very little technology and sort of pressure from uh, countries outside, namely the US uh, for, the, um, for, its, um, for the economy, the Chilean economy not to be so successful, to put it uh, mildly. Um, again, they basically celebrated uh, the moment um, and uh, the, the assembly was, uh, was performed. Yet um, in 1972, well, 1972, the project became a cultural center. 1973, there was the coup and the story radically changed. In fact, the, the UNCTAD, which was uh, that basically opened in time, and as I said, um, became a cultural center soon after with um, the positive becoming in fact a, a social tendency of sorts, including the sort of uh, the, the large scale restaurant that would bring people of different uh, uh, um, interest and, uh, and, uh, and, and kind uh, within one uh, single space. Um, and the contribution of, of artists decisively to activate the, the project. Um, it positioned basically the building importantly on the city of Santiago as a sort of um, cultural uh, gem within the sort of a debate of a forward-looking society. But then the coup came, the government palace was bombarded the the um, the dictatorship basically took over, and Pinochet and the junta took the building as the headquarters of the government uh, itself. So the building suddenly, the main hall became uh, populated by the military. Um, the building now became the sort of an infrastructure of the military, the government uh, palace, and it was therefore uh, completely um, changed in its meaning by simply encircling the building with a fence and a wall. And from that moment onwards, the building became for half the population, a left-wing building for the other half, a right-wing building. The building was also the place where uh, the government had to concede defeat after the 1988 plebiscite. And uh, thereafter was abandoned during the sort of return of democracy until in under the sort of uh, center-left uh, government, it was then uh, burned after a fire. Um, which became the start of a competition that ultimately led to the current state of a cultural center, which is called GAM, the Gabriela Mistral um, Cultural Center, and that uh, led to a new project um, that here basically implied both the, the sort of difficulty of its legacy, understood as a project in the right or in the left, and suddenly became a sort of project that uh, from the, the sort of... Uh, I mean, at best, uh, a, a sort of third way uh, left of the sort of early 2007, cutified the megastructure in order basically to both bring together the sort of right and left to a sort of slightly more tragic um, outcome as I think. So the project was uh, um, approved by Michel Bachelet, happened and it was then uh, launched. Um, and it's basically in current state of extension yet, it was yet again taken by the events of, um, barely a year ago, where basically Chilean society is being shaken by a number of, uh, of questions regarding what its future is. And the building has been actually taken again over 50 years of representing a sort of uh, fractured history in the, in, the story, in the Chilean imaginary. So the question of that studio was in fact, can the architect operate politically? Um, but, but by using basically a case study that would act as a reminder not of the optimism with which we address the question, but rather by reminding ourselves of the difficulties with which architects act in terms of a certain shortage of tools, but the possibility of architecture not to basically define its fate as a buildingness and its effect uh, thereafter. I think I'm at the level limit of my time, Guillermo, so I, um, I will basically leave it there. And if there's anything that I could wrap up, I will add uh, during the conversation. Great, thank you. Uh, finally, we can pass it on to Adriana. Hello, I will share my screen. <clears throat> 
Let's see. Yeah, we can see. Okay. You see a poster, right? Yep. Okay. So thank you for inviting me to this lecture. I think the topic is very relevant. And in this presentation, I will lay out two questions that came to my mind when I was invited to this event. And after that, I will also show one project developed by ORU to inspire a conversation. Also, I want to make a disclaimer. I have many questions and not too many answers about the concept of agency. On a side note, I believe that the topic of agency is very relevant, as I just said, yet the word agency does not exist in Spanish. I don't think that the word agency will translate as poder or power. In that sense, it would be fruitful to think about what would be our own definition of agency, especially in a Latin American context. The world is not on track. We face simultaneous crises, a, cr a climate crisis, an economic crisis, a pandemic, social inequality, racial injustices. However, as much as we want to think architecture can change those, design fields are complicit in the social, ecological, and economic crisis. This demands our immediate attention at, as we need to stop replicating and expanding them. The future will only bring more of these crises, especially under the context of climate change. For example, what happened in Texas last week. So the first question to reflect upon is, what is the agency of design in the 21st century? In other words, how do we as designers respond to the simultaneous crisis that we are living? The second reflection is inspired by Henri Lefebvre's quote, who says that, at the point we have arrived, there is an urgent need to change our intellectual approaches and tools, which leads to the second question. What tools do designers need to expand on to avoid being complicit in the world's most significant problems? I believe we need to deliver design alternatives with the required urgency, but at the same time, we need to unlearn and yet to expand our approaches. This entails blurring divisions, opening up to other fields of knowledge, expanding our scope. Only then will designers address today's pressing challenges. And I want to bring one lens that we have used at ORU of Peace for Urban Resilience, a collaborative practice where we believe design must operate and be a bridge across scales, ecosystems, social, political, and economic contexts. Especially in Latin America, the context in which we have mainly worked, but also a context where one constantly needs to adapt. Uh, first, as an introduction to our practice, my partners and myself have spent the first three years working within the government with the idea of fulfilling multiple public policy objectives. I believe this was crucial for understanding the complexities of the built environment. At ORU, during the last years, we have developed multiple projects ranging in applied research, urban design, city scale strategies, public infrastructure, landscape projects, and academia. Our work is grounded as research methodology from an experimental, proactive, and collective approach. Also, due to the nature of our practice, we are more familiar with public projects, collaborating with governments, NGO, or development banks. And depending on the scope, we regularly team up with specialists from other teams. The project I will be presenting today, it's called Medium Scale Hybrid Districts, a framework for testing alternative models of decentralized water management in Mexico City. This is an applied research project funded by the Mexico Innovation Fund from the Harvard David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. It has been developed in collaboration with Anita Beresbeta, professor of landscape architecture at the Harvard GSD. And I selected this project for various reasons. First, the project emerged as a response to Mexico's titanic water crisis along with economic, infrastructural, social, and environmental challenges. Second, due to the project's research nature, there is no client. Third, to this research, we explored the notion of collaboration as design methodology and finally, the result is a design framework as a tool for possible interventions in a complex city where no single solution will tackle the water crisis problem. This research relates to the current water management model that fundamentally needs to change. 
a city is based on the extraction and overexploitation of water resources. The city relies on a massive centralized drainage system, as you can see in the left picture, while at the same time, piecemeal uncoordinated green infrastructure efforts demonstrate no impact on the overall system. Moreover, the COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced the inequalities of a large scale infrastructural system, rendering visible that the city needs a paradigm shift from centralized water management model to a more circular, decentralized and collaborative effort to ensure a universal right, which is water access. We have used a historic area located within the central area of Mexico City as a pilot site to test ideas. It's called Tacubaya. And this diagram presents public, private, institution, academic, communities, NGOs that are simultaneously working on this site, but without a coordinated vision. Therefore, the hybrid district responds to the lack of collective vision among scales and sectors as interest collides between the government, developers, community members, and experts. While the centralized water system has flaws, the government's extenuated need to provide water only creates space for immediate but short-range solutions. As a result, the most feasible solutions ready to implement are those tested before, replicating and expanding the macro grain infrastructure without rethinking the system comprehensively. The short term immediately dismisses a collective long measure, becoming an, an obstacle for urban and social transformation. In sum, the hydro district integrates green and gray infrastructures for an alternative decentralized urban water management through design strategies of reuse, treatment, retention, and infiltration of water under a scheme of co-responsibility and shared governments. And how do we arrive to this? We tested our ideas using a collaboration as methodology. These pictures from the workshop at Tunam in 2020, right before the pandemics. We developed the inter interdisciplinary workshop to blur the boundaries between government officials, designers, academia, experts, developers, and community members. We spent two days workshopping ideas together, and then we also invited everyone to the presentation to spark a conversation. We also developed interviews and an online survey, all of these to create, oh, sorry. All of these to create a framework of multi-sectoral cooperation to begin to experiment with new city models. This might be seem easy, but in reality, finding a common ground among the different interests is the most difficult task. With this information, instead of immediately translating into design proposals, we created the hybrid district framework, a tool to expand the conventional notion of water resources. The central premise is that the urban waters, rain, gray, and black water are a valuable resource and not waste waters, which is shown in blue. We also looked at into revealing the site's hybrid history and opening up permeable green spaces. The conceptual framework translates into a set of proposals that link urban and environmental development with a water sensitive perspective. Above on the right, you can see Tacubaya today and below you can see Tacubaya as a sponge. The design framework will be presented in our upcoming hybrid district publication that will be disseminated across the city stakeholders. Stay tuned for more information. Finally, I would like to propose that the transformative projects result from a collective effort that requires links between advocates, designers, policymakers, communities, and politicians. As designers, we need to envision experimentation processes and tools where design is a fundamental component of a long-term vision with a more integrated approach. For doing this, interdisciplinary collaboration is not an option, it's the only way. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for the fantastic presentations. Um, I think that they make for a great discussion. And I'd just like to remind uh, everyone to please join the conversation and add questions to the chat. Uh, 
and we will do our best to incorporate them in the in discussion or in the Q and A uh, section at the end. Um, and so to start things off, um, the presentation has reminded me of um, of the, the idea from Marilyn Strathern of that it matters what ideas we used to think other ideas with. Um, and these different ways of looking at architecture and agency, I think uh, really big of that question. And you've touched on this in your presentations, but I would like to just start, them, start things off with a broad uh, question of asking you to expand on some of the ways that you would like to expand um, the, the notion of agency and architecture or the role of the architect uh, in describing modes of practice that attend to issues uh, such as energy, resources, uh, community building or policy, um, as well as labor and material production, uh, whether they're in, uh, in discourse or in practice, and also if uh, it's something that you have uh, references that you work with um, as you think about these topics. Is this question for someone specific or it's an open question? It's an open question, um, but if you don't mind me putting you on the spot, maybe we could start with you. Okay, I think I'm on the spot. So you mentioned many things, but I think that I like a lot what Lisa mentioned about the legacies that have not been shaken. I think that we are carrying a lot of legacies in the architecture field. We saw the example from the modernist times. And I, I think that there are so many practices and knowledge that we need to learn in order to rebuild our tools and, and look into the future because we are now in a completely different panorama where we are facing different threats, especially in the future with climate change. So how are we going to cope? Because everything in the world needs to systemically change. So. How are we going to shake this, this legacy and, and rethink our future? Yeah, if I can just add to that, I think one of the questions that comes up for me sometimes in my courses where um, I'm trying to deal directly with this, this question of the spatial paradigm that we continue to replicate over and over again um, is some of my students will sometimes ask why in a course about climate change, I wanna look backwards and I wanna look at some of these architects that everyone's saying, don't look at them, right? They're part of the, part of the problem and we have to um, sort of expand our, um, our view of architecture beyond some of these players. But I think that what happened in that time is that they put in place a very specific legacy and a very specific way of like certain conceptions of space that um, because of what happened internally to architectural discourse throughout the 20th century, um, the, and the, the way that the conversation around the death of modernism occurred, it kind of obscured some of the basic assumptions that then have continued to carry through all the way um, to today, and that different permutations of architectural discourse have not ultimately disturbed them. And, um, and so I think that the, the moment of carbon modernity doesn't begin with the modernists. It really begins in, in uh, you know, when, when you have the beginning of industry and the beginning of um, cities starting to change based on um, the growth of economies that were based on extraction. And in that case, we have to think about the legacy of colonialism um, and how slavery was a form of harnessing energy that created a model of economic growth that is the foundation for um, our fossil fuel economy of today. So in my mind, I think it, we cannot necessarily find very much agency unless we really understand the roots of the problem. Otherwise, we're going to continue to replicate it. And so that's why one of the reasons why I tend to look backwards instead of forwards in a, in a conversation often around environmental issues is because I think that one of the basic problems in architecture is that we're replicating the same model. And, and I think we have to, if we don't understand that model, then we have very little chance of breaking through it. If, if I can add very briefly, Gabriel, I, in, in my case, basically I presented rather than deal with uh, contemporary issues which are changing the nature of the problem, I think my, my take was rather one of trying to um, define a brief 
for teaching that would allow me to establish a conversation between the questions today and the questions the last time we addressed it as a field, 50 years ago in the early 70s, in a post-68 moment where there was probably the last moment of discussion of architecture and politics. And whether uh, instead of starting uh, from scratch, again, as we often do as architects, we could really build up from the knowledge of the field that was basically uh, produced then. So rather than deal with specific circumstances today, I was uh, simply trying to engage a question as it was left off in the past. And therefore, rather than start with a sort of um, optimistic approach that architecture has the ability to do many things, to start from the rather uh, skeptical moment where the debate was left off after 68, when many architects, in fact, either um, defined, uh, let's say, went away from the professional commission um, and define alternative practices, such, I mean, the famous super studio or archizoom that defined counter design as a mode of uh, finding compatibility between the trade they were trained to perform and their political ideals. Or, um, I mean, from archizoom and super studio to the sort of surfer on the wave into the, into the 80s, or, or basically those who decided to sort of abandon uh, architecture altogether because there was no way of recuperating it from uh, the, the power it basically served. Um, it was deemed that architecture was uh, slow and expensive in implied concentration to power and capital. Therefore, it would uh, have enormous difficulties in uh, offering an alternative to what the status quo was offering. In fact, Lefebvre was the one who mentioned that architecture was a projection on space of the status quo. So how could architecture be anything but the projection on space of the status quo? So of course, um, my, my, my take was not uh, deliberately uh, pessimistic, but simply trying to build up from the moment of skepticism and cashing in on the fact that I'm older than my students and my students should be more optimistic than I am. And therefore uh, my game was to try to be proven wrong, which I think I was. Although I cannot tell for sure because the building was not built and that's half of the job. Um, I think if I could just add one thing to that, because it, it makes me want to ask a question about, um, about where agency is located during the process of architectures coming into being. Because I think, Enrique, a big premise of your presentation is that once the building is in place, there's no telling what will happen to it. And so there is a way in which a building once built has no agency. So it, that's part of the argument, I assume. And so I'm just wondering if um, going to also what Adriana was saying um, in terms of a process versus an object, if there's a difference in locating agency there in the moment that an architectural concept is formulated, the potential to resist something maybe emerges there. Um, and instead of maybe once architecture is built, but I wonder what you what you think about this and whether whether there's a possibility for a building to have agency after it's it's built once it's in in place. Shall I go or Adriana? Either. I mean, you sort of set us up for it, Enrique, because you you yes. <laughs> set up the problem where right? the building gets taken over by Pinochet. So right, in fact, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a tragic outcome. Um, it's even more tragic right after. I mean, what what basically happened, the way in which the new left uh, digested and hit the old left, or it was ashamed by it. it. Was this was before the financial crisis, where basically all the techniques of uh, cutification were applied to a megastructure in order to hide it from the shame of the ideals that it uh, represented earlier. But anyway, the, I think your, your, your point is, is, is very important that uh, once a building is built, it's, uh, it's beyond the architect's uh, ability to sort of inscribe um, an, a new world. So basically it implies enormous imitation that architecture ultimately means not in terms of what the architect uh, inscribed as a building, but hence the open work, or it's not used as the architect uh, expected or inscribed in the building, but everything is in, in the end open-ended. So um, architecture has a sort of shortage of tools, um, but, but of course the, the setup is not to, um, to claim that architecture is, um, is not the right field to perform politically, but to simply tune up our expectations. And therefore um, 
sort of scrutinize uh, in depth what the Arctic can do. And I think it's, uh, it's not only the agency of Arctic, the, the agency of the Arctic, what the Arctic uh, can do. It's, it's a really, it's a difficult problem, but, but I think it's a, my, my goal as, as a teacher therefore was to set up a difficult problem that would remind the student of the outcome every time you were basically addressing it. You, you, there had, you, had the, you were dealing, you were expanding the building that was reminding you of how stale a building could be. Eric, as a follow-up, maybe also wanted to add the question or the word authorship that you touch a little bit in your presentation. So I wonder if the panelists could talk a little bit about just today's phenomenon of the architect with the capital letter A that claims authorship and recognition versus this idea maybe of relinquishing this authorship. You start touching a little bit maybe in the UNCTAD that start happening a little bit because it's a collective work. So maybe my question is, does giving away authorship provide a lens into power to the collective or public or community? Or are we in this pitfall that we don't know what's gonna happen after? Right. Should I go again, or uh, I'm, I've, I feel I'm sort of skipping turns. So, um, I, mean, I think it's a very good point, uh, Alice. But that basically, it's uh, we have to question notions of authorship. Also, authorship as delivering meaning, as, as was basically questioned in the '60s, but still lingers. Um, but authorship as uh, I think, let's say, the, the legacy of that project is, on the one hand, yeah, the building and its story, and but the fact that we can actually refer to some of the knowledge that we derive from it in terms of how the building was created, how the, the in fact, the authorship was, uh, was granted, uh, what we learn from the building as a, not only as a sort of finished object, but the process of making it and the ideas that went into it and were debated and opened up our field to some extent. So I think probably that also is another way of uh, returning to Elisa's question, which uh, one way of addressing the question, not always seeing as the building as a final object uh, to which every, procedural move is uh, conducive to. In other words, the, the, the authorship of the, of the building, you know, on the one hand, the authorship is uh, completely distorted by its, the outcome, what happened to the building. Mm -hmm. that, that's basically another form of authorship. But on the other hand, the, the, it was an extraordinary effort that we, we still know about and we can still discuss, and that basically sheds light on the way in which we can operate as architects. I think another question about this is also um, just how we use our knowledge of built form um, and how we think not just about architecture, but also about building practices. Um, and the figure of the architect as we know it today is a modern construct. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a or recent, I should say, modern with a lowercase m and, and recent. Um, and so there, for long periods of time where civilizations with no architects as we think of them today, but we're still engaging in architecture in some way, whether it would have been like some of the great works of architecture that uh, we now understand through archeological records or simply through the, the, the simple structures of shelter um, that would develop their own um, techniques of construction that were responsive to an environment or that were responsive to local ecologies. So, you know, architecture has existed for longer than the architect as we understand the, the, the figure. And so I think that the, the question of authorship is also one that's, that's new and that we have to understand in relation to all of the constructs around the architectural object as authored, which is paired especially now with the idea of the architectural object as commodified um, but I think that there's a way in which uh, the, the knowledge that we have of the built environment and of um, building systems can still be useful. And I think that we can um, not simply erase the figure of the architect, but think of the architect as someone that engages in the production of knowledge about built form. Um, and we might ask different questions about how that knowledge is shared, or we might um, create sort of uh, like open access uh, building systems and things like that, that then get 
uh, replicated in a community and that uh, sort of take a life of their own. And so there are things that we can also uh, teach. You know, we don't have to build everything ourselves and design everything ourselves for architecture still to happen. And I think architects can still embed themselves into building practices, um, you know, practices plural. And uh, in that way, think about alternative modes of, of practice. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that because I believe that the concept of authorship, it's, even if it's new, I think it's very archaic, meaning that we are the architect that will arrive as a savior and will get this magnificent building that will change everything. I think that in the current society, if you have that, I mean, you are very privileged. I think that the, the, the norm is that we need to understand how to operate in a completely different setting and to understand, okay, what is what interest is the project serving by doing that with our design? How are we are complicit in replicating certain practices that have created many troubles in the first way, for example, erasure of communities or injustice, uh, social injustices, ecological damage, just for the sake of of constructing a piece of art, right? So I think that we need to, to be more thoughtful and thinking about the process, not the process of design, but the whole process of how do you get to the project? How do you decide who, who is making the project? How do you decide what type of project you want? So, I mean, you need to see it in a more larger span of time. Also in, in the buildings, for example, you have appropriation, you have the construction, but then at certain point you need to think about maintenance. And I mean, these these infrastructures, especially if they are public, they, they have a larger a larger lifespan than that the ones we have. And and the building will live more than the time that we are working. So how do how do we create a process when you can create a, a longer term visions and engage with topics of, as ecology? and climate change, I think it's very relevant at this point, especially for uh, students that are coming right now, starting right now, I think we need to engage with these topics, but the question is how we do it. I think that that's what I, I I'm not completely sure. We have a question from uh, Abraham, if you wanna yeah. jump in. Everyone, uh, thank you, Lisa, Enrique, and Adriana for that, those wonderful presentations. And thank you, Yon Nomas for putting this event together. Um, so I'm Abraham, I'm a second year here at the Yale School of Architecture. And my question is a step away from, but I think tangentially related to what your the topic of agency. Um, and I'm curious to hear each of your takes on uh, the concept of Latinidad and how that shows up in each of, or it doesn't show up in, in your work specifically. Um, and I'm wondering, is there room in architecture for Latinidad? Well, I think that maybe the, the finding a common ground on what Latinidad is, uh, maybe you can explain a little bit more. What do you understand by that? Yeah, and I, I'm glad you asked that um, because I think the issue with putting panels like this together is that oftentimes um, people think that we're that, that communities are, mo are monolithic and based on all your presentations, it's clear that you each have a very different approach to architecture and, and built form. Um, so for me, it's I'm really just curious on on what Latinidad means to each of you, because I understand that everyone has their own definition of Latinidad, but I'm also curious to see how identity shows up in your work, specifically in relation to um, Latin, the Latin American diaspora. It sounds like you're, you're asking, um, if, can I interpret your question to mean what is our relationship to Latin American heritage in our work? Or how does it show up in your work or doesn't show up? Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can speak to that. I mean, I think um, I, so in the past few years, I've been lucky enough to work with a community on the, that on the border, the, the community is called San Isidro and it's right up against the, the US-Mexico border, uh, very close to where I grew up. 
Um, so it's it's been a really amazing opportunity to um, work in this place that is one that I that was very formative for me. Um, you know, I grew up on the border and very much was um, you know always dealing with the with the, you know the Mexican side, the American side, always crossing one side to the other, not just. Um, crossing the physical border, but even in my own identity. Um, and so it's been a real pleasure to be able to, to work there uh, because it's a, it's a site that has been very formative for me and the border is, is something that um, I think has very much shaped my own concepts of territory, the arbitrariness of that line and just having to um, deal with its extreme spatial ramifications um, while confronting its, its pure arbitrariness and, and the pure abstraction of it. And um, so that, I think the border itself is certainly something that from an early age was, was formative um, in terms of trying to think through um, the relationships between space and politics and, and form. Um, but, but then also in working with these communities, um, with this nonprofit in particular, we're, we're in conversations with them about helping them with, with a community land trust. And so there for me, one of the questions that we've really engaged with, with them there is to ask how, how building occurs in the community. They want to have an anti-gentrification strategy. They want to build. And so a lot of what we've been asking is how do you build without development? What's development without developers look like? And what does density without displacement look like? And so in those conversations, we very much started to talk about the mobilization of social labor and have worked with many presidents from Latin America. And one that has been central to us is uh, the president of, of the Minga, which is a workers cooperative um, from the Quechua people. And so, um, you know, thinking about these questions of, of cooperatives and uh, sort of alternative modes of organizing economies for us, Latin America provides many um, alternatives. And so um, I think the, the, the question of how society is organized and understanding it in a Latin American context is, is a way in which we've been able to really think about that um, in practice. Uh, I also wanted to touch a little bit what Adriana started talking about uh, the savior mentality and the archaic <laughs> mentality of that. Uh, last summer, just have had a lot of discussions about our housing studio and how approaching the Bronx community, for example, where the site was located. So in my year, uh, the approach maybe didn't render a super sensitive approach, but I believe that they make efforts to improve this top-down view as the idea of the savior to a more collaborative approach to work within the territory. So maybe a first part question of that is, uh, how do I, we identify the client and who's the builder in a broader sense? When I was in Erika's studio, we spent a lot of the time uh, questioning who is the client in our project, Adri talked the project that doesn't have a client. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit. Um, sometimes in the community, the client, the, the community becomes a client and sometimes it's also the builder. So I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. So I think that um, we, we I think we, we need to be innovative about our practices because conventional practices will have a conventional client and I understand there's obviously a value for that and it's the way we work. But also if we consider the community our client, I don't think the community is a client. It's, it's, I think we need to build that relationship with the place that we are working and the context that we are working and so, so that we engage because at the end, these places have links to social patterns. They have linked to ecological patterns also as, for example, they, if you're building on the ground that, that it will flood or you know, thinking about climate change and these things. 
also if, if you're looking into economics, maybe you would be building a project that will regenerate the, the economy by, by building the project, you generate jobs. So I think that we, we must expand what's the impact of the project and, and connecting the dots. I, I see more the, the role of the architect of a mediator or connecting the dots between different agencies, different pers persons, stakeholders, however you want to call it, in the ground, because I think we have the ability to visualize. So I think it's also uh, the power of visualization and the narratives that we bring into the project are very important as well. I'd, I'd like to follow up with one idea, I think that maybe relates to what we were just discussing, Abraham's um, question as well, which is, I think an idea of regulation within the Latin American context. I think it's clear to people who have practiced in Latin America that there is a different kind of regulation, a much more relaxed regulation. And I just wanted to know like, when you think about the value of that in thinking about expanded boundaries and, and, and practice and, and discourse. Versus, for example, working within the United States. I mean, that I, being from Tijuana as well, uh, can recognize a distinct difference between working on one side of the border and another. Well, I can I can respond. <laughs> Look, I don't want to take the stage, but. Um... No one was speaking, so I'll take it the turn. Uh, but I think that this idea that Latin America has no rules, I think it's not true. I think we there are norms, and we need. I, I think we 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 need to operate them. There might be more relaxed, but but I think there's there's a system in place, and the concept that might be useful was one that I mentioned at the beginning. It's, I think that this context of crisis, obviously I have this in mind because we are living this precise time in the pandemic and we have been already for a year, almost in a few days maybe, uh, we have been in our houses. But I think that in Latin America, we had experienced different crises before, even the pandemic in Mexico hit it 10 years ago or so. Uh, we had economic crises, we have disasters, as we, in, uh, at least in Mexico, we have to coast. So every year we have hurricanes, we have heard about social inequality. So I think it's how to deal with these very relevant topics that are in place in our communities, how to engage with the government in order to, to bring out ideas. I think that uh, also the architecture and politics it's very present. Uh, Enrique portrays one, one vision of it, of how politics really influence even the, the use of the space. And, and, and I think that, that as architects, we need to engage more and be more politically active, sometimes not in the role of designer, sometimes in the role of activist. I think I would also be wary of associating a lack of regulation with more freedom. Um, I would be wary of that for a couple of reasons. Um, and I think the larger question is, you know, what kind of um, sort of social contracts are we working with in general? No, and I think Texas right now is the perfect example of, um, of a discourse around deregulation, allowing things, but you know, it, it really depends on how that then plays out, right? And it really depends on who grabs power in that deregulated environment. And, and often there isn't really deregulation, um, there's simply regulation in favor of a certain party. So I think the question is, um, how do we think more expansively around the terms of engagement? Um, and I think in architecture, we can ask that. And I think bringing in, for example, questions around the environment is central to that. We have to change the terms of engagement. So we're not simply measuring the value of architecture according to its, its uh, economic potential, but we also have to measure it against 
all of these other things. We have to think about um, the well-being of uh, people, and the we have to think about the relationship between different social groups that exist within the building, right? So, I mean, there are just all these questions that I think the the question is not like, do we control more or less? Um, I think the question is more, how do we think about the terms of engagement, and what kind of rules do we produce that can uh, maximize at least some sort of um, equal footing when there's there's tension in the built environment because there is no such thing as consensus and there's no such thing as um, sort of a, an easy um, sort of contestation of space, right? It's, it's always, there's always um, a kind of agonism. And so I think the question is what are the institutions that we build that can maximize um, democratic discussion around what should be what the built environment should be and democratic practices around the production of the built environment. Not to say that it exists more here than in Latin America, but just in general, I think the question of rules is an important one. Well, that kind of leads into another question that we that we've been thinking about, which is uh, the idea of a relationship between agency and and mandate. Um, so, you know, often in, in practice, the issue of agency is circumscribed by a client-centric economic mandate. Um, so I'd like to hear what you think about how one practices within an economic paradigm that is a kind of constant and intractable threat to, uh, for example, ecological stability. That's the question. <laughs> that is the question of the, yeah, of the round table. That's, uh, in fact, it is, I think the, the core of the issue is the professional agreement. That's, the, yeah, the mandate. That's where, where the, basically the architect has the ability to say, no, I don't do it, or yes, I do it. And if you do it, to find the way in which you can actually operate to be more or less uh, in tune with your own principles and operate uh, sort of, yeah, you, you operate within constraints and then you might be able to move through them in such a way that you find uh, the outcome is compatible with your uh, position on the world. I think that was at least what I was trying to aim at. And so some of the examples in, in the 60s, let's say the whole Italian debate or the whole French debate after the 60s, many, sort of many thought that it was uh, impossible to impossible to sort of uh, work professionally without giving up your your goals that it was uh, and therefore many decided not to do it so so the, the i think the question has to do with your own uh, position on the world that's uh, to me the question of agency is one of the a person standing in the world vis-a-vis -vis, uh, his or her uh, vision and principles and uh, and how do you operate whether you decide to do it or not and if you do how and it's yeah, uh, Oh, sorry. sorry. No, go ahead, Eddie. <laughs> oh, I was just going to agree with you and, and really just say that I think that this question of refusal is a really important one. But also, um, I think one of the reasons why it, it's very difficult in architecture to engage in refusal is this feeling that the machine will continue without us and that construction will happen without us and or someone else will simply take the right. job. And so another thing that I feel like we have to add is the importance also for architects to organize and really work together because the that's where the act of refusal begins to have power. And so um, I've been saying for a long time that I really want to organize a luxury condo strike. Nobody build any more luxury condos. Um, and I say it sort of in jest, but also I'm very serious. <laughs> I think that you know these are the kinds of things that we have to really consider um, because because these are the things that we continue to replicate, right? It, the, the, it's, we, we have these, um, not only the particular mode of production involved in building that kind of typology, but also the typology itself, right? And the economy that is embedded into. So there's so many aspects of it that are replicating the paradigm, even if you put solar panels on it, um, even if you insulate it so that it's more energy efficient. And so, to me, that's at the heart of this, this problem is really reconsidering what the construction of architecture entails and what our role is in that. And um, seeing that these things will kind of uh, 
happen almost on their own, whether we participate or not, I think is one of the reasons why there's an enormous feeling of lack of agency. But I think that the more we bring that to the conscious level and the more as, as, a, as a discipline and as a profession, we grapple with it directly, um, the more I think we can engage in these acts of refusal, um, which I think are extremely important. Right. If I, if I could add something, I think the, the act of refusal has two conditions. One, it's how you stand in the world vis-a-vis -vis your own principles regardless of the effect it may have. Because in fact, it was, uh, as, as Elisa mentioned, a sort of old cliche was, okay, if I say no, someone else will do it. But that didn't imply that you would be sort of sleeping well at night uh, if you said, yes, I will do it because otherwise someone else will do it. So one is the way in which you stand vis-a-vis -vis the world. The other one is whether that will have an effect on the world. I think uh, it's more likely to sort of uh, achieve the first, the former, than the latter. The latter is a difficult one. Although Elisa is right, yeah, if you if, if, if can actually get to an, such an act of refusal, um, a coordinated one, um, which is more thinkable today than it was 10 years ago, um, it, it definitely would have an effect. Now, of course, that effect has to do with the agency of architecture, but not the agency of the building. Um, but again, that's so it's, it's still, and, and it would qualify as a sort of alternative practice as well, that architects have basically, since the cornerstone of the problem is the professional uh, practice, and, uh, and the fact that architecture, that the architect serves someone in power that represents capital and that is quite unlikely that through his or her work would basically undermine or subvert the power that that uh, represents. Um, architects have actually expanded uh, the field to operate in, in different ways. I mean, counter design was precisely that. Super Studio or Archizoom said, no stop cities, basically a product which uses drawing, which is cheap and fast as a way of showing the ways in which uh, society is unfolding, the contradictions of our society by virtue of architectural knowledge and drawing. So it's architectural and part of the field, but it operates in a different way than if you were engaging building which is slow, and in fact, slow enough for uh, the political realm to completely change over the course of the eight years that a building takes. Um, but in addition to that, it implies concentration of power and capital. So so I, th I think, Gabriel, that's, I think, the, the question at stake here, I would say. Yeah, and, but what, what about what about the idea, for example, how hard is that line? Is there is there space for the idea as well that um, within the act of refusal, there's also an idea of using uh, current systems or subverting current systems? The kind of the, the, the idea that in expanding practice, there's also the idea of strategy and the and the idea of the architectural trick, appropriating uh, common uh, uh, forms of, of, of production in order to then instill uh, different uh, agendas. True, I, I, I agree. That, that, and in fact, I think part of the conversation has to do precisely with what, what you're pointing uh, to, which is that the architect's ability to really read finely the conditions under which he or she works. In other words, the, the set of constraints under which you, you work to see whether there are spaces of operation, space of freedom with, or space of subversion or spaces of undermining systems. But often these are rhetorical and as such, they're sort of bound to the same uh, um, um, outcomes buildings where basically meaning is changed uh, instantly. So, uh, but, but I agree, yeah, that at the level of strategies where this uh, is, um, finds its potential and really reading, uh, yeah, it's basically, it, it ultimately agency is about finding the, the way in which you operate within a series of circumstances and conditions that are specific. Um, which I would also uh, also cl claim that in that respect, it would be also important to going back to the previous two questions to understand that the, the South America is not cohesive. So it, it, the, the conversation is really about uh, reading finely circumstances that change enormously from one condition to another. I believe that in certain ways, sometimes we are obsessed with building and getting done all the projects that we get. But on the other hand, I think it would be very brave to not only to refuse the project, but also to, to think about what are the consequences of the designs that we are doing. For example, I've seen projects that are built in natural areas that are conservation areas that you shouldn't be building there. And there are some, uh, luxury buildings placed there for the sake of connecting with nature, which I don't think you are connecting with nature, you're destroying nature. 
or for example, we have to admit that concrete is one of the materials that pollute the most and we are using concrete for our buildings. Buildings use energy and the energy is also one of the causes that we have, we are now in the midst of the climate change crisis. So we are relating to this crisis and how are we going to um, not replicate them, but maybe the concept of not building anything new in cities. Maybe that it's very radical, but maybe it's something that we can think how to work with it's already in place. Why we need to continue expanding cities and metropolitan areas horizontally. Maybe we can start to fill out the voids inside the cities. I don't know. I think that in, in thinking where the project comes from and what is what is the impact in the long term, not only with the society, but with the with the planet. I think that is very important. Yes, if I may follow up on that, uh, thinking of agency as an act of, you know, expanding possibilities, but also as an act of refusal. Uh, Enrique mentioned at some point in his lecture, how can we position ourselves uh, vis a vis a building uh, which function or, or purpose uh, has changed? But uh, it also brings the question how can we position ourselves uh, in relationship to a curriculum? that hasn't changed because, you know, to get to the point of being the architect, uh, we need to go through architectural education. So I was just wondering if you can elaborate on what different kind of mechanisms can we put in place to, to reach that, uh, to bridge the, the gap between how architects are educated versus how we practice. I think this is a central question uh, for all schools as we think about how we're going to engage in the climate crisis and, and everything that's happening. But I also think that um, sometimes it's tempting to think that architecture itself is the problem. And I think that the relationship between architecture and its larger context has become problematic. But that doesn't mean that you don't have to learn how to make a building. And I think that there's a question in my mind, which is how does knowledge of how to make a building empower you in this context to have agency? Um, because if you have knowledge of how something happens, you also have a better opportunity to understand how it might be different. Um, and I think that's very important. And um, I also think that, um, you know, power plays out in space. And so we as architects, part of our education is to, is to learn to see space in a particular way that's different from other disciplines that work in the built environment. So we're different from um, engineers in that way and we're different from contractors in that way and we're different from craftspeople in that way in that a very central element is to see space and to see form. And if the more we educate ourselves also about these other dynamics around economy and power and uh, inequality, I think the more we are able to correlate that to how it plays out in space and have a very unique point of view in terms of what needs to change. Um, so I think, for example, in the discourse around transforming built environments um, relative to the climate crisis, you know, one of the paradigmatic and most problematic examples of carbon form is a suburb. But a lot of the proposals by environmentalists around um, the transformations of suburbs often lack uh, this sort of spatial aspect, right? And so I think as a result, a lot of the environmental proposals for suburbs end up being, or at least operating, not at the deeper level, right? It might be around energy efficiency of the home, or it might be around solar panels, or it might be around walkability of streets or bikeability to a certain extent. But the question of how you fully transform the suburb so that it becomes something else is something that an architect, through their knowledge of the built world, can, can contribute to in a unique way. So as, as important as it is for architects to educate themselves as widely as possible to understand the context in which we operate as comprehensively as possible, I think it's also very important 
to, um, to know our own fuel very well. Um, otherwise, I think we accidentally replicate the things that are problematic with architecture or that are problematic about architecture, I should say. I, I would second, I, I, I would second Elisa in both in her comment, but also in, in celebrating your question that I think it's as decisive as the, the, the previous one. I, I also believe that basically, yeah, you, you, you learn, uh, you learn your education somehow is doomed to being a bit slow in relation to where you apply it. And I think that's, uh, that's part, it's, it's sort of definitional that, uh, that we, we sort of learn uh, the sort of series of debates and conversations within our field. We know it well enough to basically have the ability to raise questions and to understand the way in which uh, emerging conditions in the world redefine what we do, but also the way in which we can actually rethink the way in which architecture engages the world. So in other words, we, we have the ability to raise questions precisely because we have a knowledge of, of the field. But that implies uh, often that uh, what we teach is out of touch slightly with uh, the contemporary. In other words, we, we, we teach to raise questions. In order to do that, we must teach things that are a bit uh, slow in relation to engaging. That's the nature of teaching. Um, and, um, and then basically, yeah, um, somebody who sort of, uh, you, you teach to, you teach the ability to raise questions. And in order to do that, you basically have to instill a sort of uh, knowledge of the field as Elisa was, uh, was uh, emphasizing. But do you think that the teaching is slow or somehow the execution of architecture is slow? Because I think one thing that we do constantly in architecture school is that we, be, we behave in school as though architects do have agency. You know, we ask students to write their own briefs. We ask them to select the constituency of the housing that they're designing. We ask them right, to set the terms for the architecture coming into being. That's not something that happens. And so I think that that is an essential pedagogical tool for understanding architecture's power, but I'm not sure how that gets taken up afterwards. And so in many ways, I think that that school, it can be slow in some ways in that perhaps it's um, sort of our own history is heavy on our shoulders in an academic setting. But at the same time, I think that there's a potential in an academic setting that doesn't exist. And what I see, I think, more often with my students is a kind of impatience because in school we're behaving as though architects have agency. And then there's this knowledge that when we go out there, we don't. I agree. It's, I think it's a difficult question, but I would say that architecture is a slow field. I mean, if let's say if we acknowledge that buildings play an important role within our field and buildings take six, eight years to be built. Mm -hmm. In other words, the architectural knowledge is developed at a sort of slow pace. We tend, let's say academia, funny enough, is faster than the, the field. I would say that, uh, that, that we have to come to terms with a number of definitional things, such as the fact that architecture is slow as a field. Mm -hmm. um, that gives us enormous uh, advantage as well. Um, we, we can actually be extremely thoughtful about uh, how we our field engages the world and, uh, and also digest the questions that are emerging as they happen with a different speed. I think part of my presentation had to do with the fact that, for instance, the question on architecture and politics that has been discussed intensely over the past few years has never engaged the last moment at which that discussion was uh, taken by the field. So we started from scratch. It's always like that. We always start from scratch. We forget, and then we engage. And then a few, five years later, we get bored and we change. Um, that's the nature of our, of our uh, academic setting. We are um, very, very, we try to be a bit too fast, but also we, um, we tend to be very, not too patient with the topics. Um, of course, what I'm saying is not terribly popular or, uh, or exciting, but, uh, but I do believe that uh, slowness is a sort of a condition of architecture and probably an, uh, an important attribute to sort of uh, nourish in academia. Actually, I think that uh, this concept of slowness, it's, it, it would be good to have it in, in, in practice because the reality, at least this might personal experience is that when you get a project, you need to do it really fast. You don't have time to think. In reality, you need to respond. If, if, you have, if you're working with the government, okay, you need the design in two months ready for construction. So 
So I, I think that this idea of the immediacy and that everything will get built very fast, whereas the slowness of we have time to think about it and reflect and I think that's that's something that could happen in academia. And I see also the academia as a place of experimentation. In my mind, I feel completely that we need to have other skills rather than just learn to draw in AutoCAD of this in my, my experience. We, we need to be able to have a discussion about the economy, about politics, about the environment, to have other terms of knowledge that we are not learning. I think that uh, maybe uh, learning more multidisciplinary it doesn't mean that we are now going to be scientists and understand everything or economists, because I don't think that's our role, but maybe finding these common grounds in which we can start to be part of the decision-making processes, at least in the maybe political realms, also in the financial realms. Sometimes we are just expecting to get the project as a commission, but if, if we could transform the project from, from a larger perspective, uh, when the project was thought or, or decided to be done, I think that we could have some influence because I think we do have an agency or a say in these projects but if we cannot engage with the conversations with the other, if, if we're working in silos, I, I don't think we will get farther enough. And I think it, I don't think there's also a problem from architecture. I think that the other disciplines are also working in their silos and, and that we need to blur that, especially right now. Well, it also becomes difficult to engage the problems that our work might cause in these other areas if we're not familiar with the other areas. So I think that's one of the most important reasons to have a really comprehensive understanding of the ecological crisis and of ecological dynamics because architecture acts upon ecosystems very actively. And so, you know, without a working knowledge of that sort of thing, we cannot help but create this kind of damage. So I, I think that um, in that sense, knowledge is agency because you are able to uh, not only make a choice if you design it one way or another, but even in the first place, see the problem. And you can't have agency if you don't in the first place see the problem. I think that will be a really nice way of uh, wrapping up, uh, Elisa, sort of a, a Foucault uh, sort of um, um, paraphrase <laughs> that, that knowledge is agency. And in fact, because it also reaffirms what you, what you claimed before about education. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do believe it's a really uh, extraordinary line to sort of, uh, yeah, to, to emphasize the, interesting enough, the fact that as a conversation, this has actually, I feel that it has actually worked, worked quite a bit. We, we address different topics. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a guest and I'm, it looks as if I was wrapping up and I, it's not my role, but I- um, <laughs> I was about to, so that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, but I, but, it, but it, I, I, I must say that I'm, I, I feel extraordinarily uh, rewarded by, uh, by seeing that we address very different questions in our presentation, that suddenly uh, through the questions and the conversation, a number of topics are really overlapping um, quite fast, actually, because I, I tend to think it happens over time. These are difficult questions and they deserve, in fact, the time to build up the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, uh, that was a great wrap up, Erike. <laughs> But I, I would like to ask if the panelists and the guests could stay a little bit more because we are a little over time where we wanted to touch in some questions that appeared in the chat, if that's okay. Absolutely. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, I think, uh, I don't know if Brian is there, if he wants to ask, or I can also read. Uh, as Peggy Dreamer suggests, should we drop the title architect to open up potential for other forms of agency as shift society, uh, societal roles, retraining the public to understand that we don't just design buildings for consumption is more difficult than we positioning ourselves entirely around other forms of spatial intelligence. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I think that there, um, there is an important question as to what architectural work is thought to be versus what it is. Um, and one example I will give of that, that I think is really important is simply the development around environmental legislation right now and the conversation around the Green New Deal. Um, a lot of it centers around the built environment, um, but 
I don't know of any legislator that has reached out uh, to architects to really help shape some of this um, conversation. And um, so I think that there are many examples like that where the perception of what architectural labor is or what architectural expertise is um, from the public is limited. And as a result, I don't think we're necessarily thought of as people who, who can really help in this moment of transition. And um, it's in a conversation around policy, um, you know, we could still, I think without being policy makers, have a lot of knowledge that is worth sharing. If I could add something, I would, um, I, I'm skeptical of um, changing terms rather than the, the thing. Um, so it, I, um, in other words, the rhetorical act of changing, dropping the name architect, uh, rather than uh, addressing the way in which we operate as, as architects. Um, in that respect, very much I'm a follower, basically what Lampedusa said, that basically everything must change so that nothing changes. I'm extraordinarily skeptical of, uh, of the symbolic change that it allows for everything to go on as it was. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather scrutinize the architect rather than the word. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and I think in the end, it's more a question of asking what architectural expertise is and what it is that we can share rather than sort of dissolving the idea of the architect. I think that actually we share a lot of things with other disciplines that are not precisely called architecture, but for example, with landscape architecture, with urban design, with urban planning. I think that most of them are, that's why I, I, I like to say more about maybe the design field, maybe that's more big, but it doesn't encapsulate you. To, okay, you're a landscape architect and you do parks, you're a planner and you'll do zoning and you architect and you do the building because I think the architect or the designer has the ability to go across the scales. So work at a larger scale and be part of a Green New Deal proposal, for example, or work in a specific design. I think that it's also a matter of what are the interests of each practice or how can we build new modes of practice that will engage not with the traditional field, but with a more expanded notion of what design is and what is the relationship to the world. I'm gonna add another question from, uh, we have a question from Andrew uh, that says, do you think architecture has a lot to learn from the discipline of landscape architecture, which often prioritizes process over objects? Yeah, I think that we, we if, if, if in this design field, we start to blur the boundaries, I think we, we can learn more from the landscape architects in the process, uh, in, in the ecology, we can learn more for public policy in planning. I, I think that uh, for, for me, I think that uh, actually that's a, a way that we have worked within Oro. I don't think we, we fit into the traditional architecture field and uh, I think that it's, we feel comfortable with that actually. We have another question by Luis Miguel on the subject of language and specifically to Adriana's point about the complicated translation of agency into the Spanish language. I'm wondering what the panelists thought uh, are on implications of agency and authorship of on architecture writing. I'm not sure I understand the question. Is the question to say, are the questions of agency and authorship different when one is writing about architecture as opposed to designing? Yes, yeah, about writing architecture. Architecture thinks the word agency doesn't translate into Spanish or Portuguese. I think we can, that's an interesting exercise to come up with our word. And because it's not agencia, 
poder. So I don't know uh, if we'll get to that word today, but I think it would be interesting to have in mind. I mean, I think on that note, I think we can wrap up and that's actually a very good exercise uh, for each of us to take home. Uh, I just want to thank our three panelists and our student moderators, Alice and Gabe, on behalf of the Noma. Thank you for providing your time and, and I think it was a very fruitful conversation. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If we could ask the panelists to say, for a tiny bit. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Thank you.